Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to our afternoon session. Um, my name is Chow, and I'm the plant sciences librarian at Purdue. Uh, so um, today, it is with great pleasure that I introduce our next speaker for today, um, my dear fellow Purdue alumni, Dr. Shangtian Yang. Dr. Yang is a professor of uh, chemical and biomolecular engineering at The Ohio State University. Dr. Yang's main research focus is around the field of bioprocess engineering. And today, Dr. Yang is going to talk to us about biofuels from renewable biomass and carbon dioxide in a circular bioeconomy. Welcome, Dr. Yang, and the spring is all yours. All right, thank you for the introduction. Let me share my screen. All right, can you see my screen? Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Good, all right. Let me... All right. All right, so it's my pleasure to be here to speak to you about my research uh, on biofuel production from renewable biomass and carbon dioxide. And this is important in the uh, circular bioeconomy. So as shown in here, in, the, in this environment, we use solar energy, carbon dioxide to grow plants, and we can convert them into biofuel and we burn biofuel, then recycle the CO2 back to the environment. And uh, this is the circle. So really, in my talk, I will talk about sustainable production of fuel and chemical from renewable biomass using biobutanol as an example. Before I give my major topic, I will briefly introduce myself. I graduated from Purdue. I have been at Ohio State for over 35 years. My research really focused on bioprocess engineering that involves cell and the metabolic engineering, bioreactor engineering, and the integrated process with product separation. And for various applications ranging from production bio, uh, in the nutrition product like prebiotics to biofuel chemical, and uh, also in tissue and cell engineering for cell therapy and the biodiagnostic. Just a brief background about bioprocess as shown in this slide. In the typical bioprocess for chemical production, you start from various feedstock carbon sources that usually will be going through some pretreatment. Then the complex biomolecule like polysaccharide need to be break down into monosaccharide or sugar through enzymatic treatment, start using amylase, cellulose using cellulases. And after that, the fermentable sugar will be converted to various metabolite or chemical by various microorganisms, can be E. coli, yeast, or clostridium, and other microorganisms. Then after fermentation, you will have to separate and purify the product through various separation technology to get your final product. So that's the general bioprocess. And in my research related to biobutanol production, certainly we have to deal with all of this unit operation and all of this uh, input. So in my talk, I will first give you a background introduction about circular bioeconomy basically involving in the biofuel production from renewable resources. And actually we also call this as bioresource engineering that involve industrial biotechnology 
and sometimes industry referring to biorefinery. And then I will give you more technical uh, background or you know, related to my research uh, that is bioprocessing for biofuel and chemical production and focusing on engineering the clostridia for biobutanol production and leading to a consolidated bioprocessing. And finally, summarize the message for today and uh, give you a few of my own perspective for the future. So the circular bioeconomy or CBE, which is also same as a chemical in the biomolecular engineering. I like that. Okay, basically sustainable engineering. Uh, most people are probably familiar with the current concern about plastic recycling. So whatever the plastic produced from petroleum feedstock need to be recycled, reused to minimize the landfill and the, the environmental pollution. So that is uh, one of the biggest driver in the sustainable engineering. So similarly, you know, for biofuel, you know, uh, how we control and recycle the CO2 or the you know, uh, carbon dioxide emission, that is uh, our focus. So in fact, for resource engineering, we are concerned about energy, water, the material and so forth. And that has something to do with our living environment. So that's the sustainable engineering. And uh, in, uh, today, the biofuel, we talk about energy. And certainly it also has implication to water, air, food, and the material and so forth, including health. So in a typical uh, industrial setting, we produce all kinds of uh, chemical material and the uh, product through petroleum feedstock or oil. So in the petroleum refinery, you produce a wide range of chemical product and also substantial oil goes into the energy product for gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, and so forth. Okay, so that's the current petroleum refinery. So biorefinery or industrial biotechnology is trying to change the polluting or non-sustainable petroleum refinery with, uh, repl by replacing petroleum with plant-based feedstock like uh, uh, grass, leaf, and so forth. So that's biorefinery. So the basic concept biorefinery, which is also you know, uh, called as the second industrial revolution, versus the first revolution is petroleum. So the biomass, plant-based biomass, can be converted to fuel chemical material instead of using petroleum. And there are two main platform or route to get to here. One is sugar platform or biochemical conversion. The other is thermochemical platform or syngas platform which is similar to uh, current petroleum uh, process using high temperature, high pressure for the conversion. So either route are being uh, heavily researched and developed, reaching the same goal, but whatever is better, it depends. But in my research, we focus on the sugar platform or biochemical conversion, this route. So speaking about biofuel, so various feedstock can be used as the starting material. Historically, corn, sugar cane, and second generation using plant biomass like grass, wood, and so forth. And as I mentioned, there are two routes. One is bioconversion, which is my favorite. The other is thermochemical process and the contrast between the two is listed here. The bioconversion in general is considered more environmental friendly because the process involves normal temperature pressure and usually have high conversion, high purity product and higher recovery of the product compared to thermochemical process, 
which is in the similar to current petroleum uh, industry involving high temperature, high pressure, and uh, can be very polluting as well. So the biofuel also can be classified as gas, like methane or hydrogen, or liquid biofuel, methanol, ethanol, and in my research, we focus on butanol, the higher alcohol, and also in the uh, granulate chip can be used to burn to generate heat, that's the solid biofuel. So in my talk, I will focus the liquid biofuel on butanol. So bioconversion, I have to go back to biotechnology, which uh, is the foundation technology to make things uh, happen. So biotechnology, has many, many applications, including for human health, like pharmaceutical, vaccine, you know, biomedical, like cell gene therapy, and so forth. And in agriculture for transgenic plant, transgenic animal. And for us, we are interested in industrial biotechnology for production of fuel, chemical, and for prevention and uh, treatment of the environmental pollution. So industrial biotechnology uh, is important to pharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical production and in agricultural food industry. And for chemical industry, uh, there are large amount chemical produced from petroleum or oil. Those can be uh, essentially produced from biomass using bioconversion or other technology. And for fuel and energy, the two largest biofuel today, one is the ethanol, currently primarily produced from corn in the US, about 18 billion gallon annually, and the biodiesel, primarily produced from vegetable oil, including soybean oil, and some animal fat, about 3 billion gallon annually in the US. So, the current production really is using a uh, food crop. So that has caused some concern for you know, food versus, versus uh, fuel. Fuel will take away the, the, the food. Uh, in, uh, in many third world countries, they are still hungry. They don't have enough food and uh, we convert them into energy for driving car and the servos. That has been a concern. So that will lead into the uh, second generation biofuel here shows the general skin for microbial production of biofuel and the bio-based chemical. Basically, naturally, we have sunlight and carbon dioxide to grow the plant, whether it's corn or in the sugar cane and so forth, or energy crop. So they contain either starch or cellulose. Those are the polysaccharide. And uh, after enzymatic treatment, they can be break down into simple sugar. And those sugar can be easily used by microorganisms, bacteria, yeast, and so forth. And converting the sugar into various metabolites that include organic acid, alcohol, and some biopolymer. Alcohol can be used for biofuel. There's another route uh, heavily researched and promoted by DOE, that is a microalgae. They can use CO2 directly to produce the algae biomass that contain protein, carbohydrate, and lipid. Some of them can produce very high content of the lipid or oil, and the oil can be converted to biodiesel. So that's the two general uh, skin or a loot to produce a biofuel, currently being developed and researched. And in this, the first generation biofuel is generally produced from food crop like corn or sugar cane. That's the first generation. And second generation is used non-food crop like uh, corn stover, sugar cane biogas, and so forth. And that's the second generation, basically it's, uh, using cellulosic material as the feedstock instead of the uh, starch 
or sugar-based. And a third generation biofuel is referring to using carbon dioxide as the feedstock instead of uh, growing the plant. Okay, the carbon dioxide can be used directly by microalgae. Also, some microorganisms can also fix carbon dioxide to produce various metabolites. Okay, so that's the three generation of different biofuel depending on the feedstock, whether it's food crop or non-food crop or carbon dioxide. On top of that, in order to make the process efficient, recombinant DNA technology has been heavily used to improve or engineer the organism to be more effective in converting those various feedstock into the final product. All right, as I say, biofuel can be liquid biofuel like ethanol, butanol. Butanol is considered as an advanced biofuel compared to ethanol. They can be produced from corn sugar cane, cassava, that's first generation, and second generation from cellulosic biomass, and third generation from carbon dioxide, and other like biodiesel, biogasoline, alcohol oil, and hydrogen and biogas like methane. Okay, so these are the biofuel, and I will only focus on butanol, the liquid biofuel, in my talk. The global biofuel production uh, is illustrated in this chart. Okay, you can see biofuel production increase every year, and uh, you know this is a projection for continue to increase. And among this biofuel. Most of them are the corn ethanol and sugarcane ethanol. They are all in the earlier is almost 100% and uh, it's projected to reduce because of the uh, cellulosic biofuel is projected to increase to replace corn and the sugarcane. And the uh, other advanced fuel, okay, like in the higher alcohol and the hydrocarbon. Okay, so that's the general distribution of the biofuel uh, for the in the last 15, 20 years. So you can see the continued growth. So to talk about biofuel production, we have to go back to the uh, uh, corn refinery because corn so far has been the major uh, feedstock for ethanol production or in the biorefinery industry. So this shows the general corn refinery. The corn comes in, we're going through steeping, grinding, grinding, and separation to get the starch. And starch will be hydrolyzed to get dextrose or glucose. And glucose then will be either converted enzymatically to high fructose corn syrup or hydrogenation to sorbitol or fermentation to various products, including ethanol. So that's the current corn refinery. You can produce a myriad of different products from a single grain of corn. For second generation, we need to also take care of the uh, leftover, like the fiber, or in you know, a corn cup, corn stover left in the corn field. Okay, this cellulosic material can be process to get the carbohydrate, hemicellulose, cellulose out and into the fermentable sugar, then use for fermentation to produce the product. So that's the second generation corn refinery can, uh, should be involved to take care of this uh, leftover uh, byproduct or residue. Similarly, uh, soybean is another major uh, crop in the US uh, for biodiesel. You go through the soybean oil extraction, then transesterification to get the biodiesel. And in the process, you generate some uh, uh, byproduct like glycerol, and uh, of course the hull of the soybean, and uh, you know uh, the cornmeal uh, containing largely you know protein and some carbohydrate. Okay, will be further processed, and uh, this. Glycerol and soy soluble containing the 
soy polysaccharide, oligosaccharide, they can be uh, additional feedstock for fermentation to produce various products. Okay, so again, you know, uh, we need to address this uh, byproduct in the refinery. And uh, in the soybean field, you have the soybean straw and other stuff, the lignocellulose stuff that can be treated to get the high mass cellulose, cellulose and hydrolase to the fermentable sugar for fermentation. Okay, so that is the uh, complete picture of soybean based biorefinery, including first and second generation biofuel generation. So, briefly, uh, in case you don't have the background, you know, I mentioned starch as one of the current major carbon source for fermentation. So carb, uh, starch in general has to be, this is the starch uh, polymer, need to be break down into glucose by various enzyme, alpha, beta amylase, glucose amylase, and so forth. Okay, this just showing in a rice grain, you have the starch granule, they have to be break down to get the mono sugar glucose for fermentation. So this is a very relatively mature technology in corn refining, refinery, uh, in corn refining industry and in the corn ethanol industry. For cellulose, it's a different story. Cellulose is very similar to starch, but the, the linkage between two glucose units is different. This is the beta 1,4 glycosidic bond versus uh, starch is alpha 1,4. So that difference and also uh, cellulose forming the uh, sheet. Uh, with hydrogen bond, almost like a crystal, very difficult to break up. So, you know, this is the uh, fiber of the cellulose. To break up this tightly knit together uh, beta sheet cellulose fiber, you have to use a variety of cellulases, including endo and the uh, um, endoglucanase and the cellulobiohydrolase and glucohydrolase and so forth to break down the cellulose into glucose, the monosaccharide. And it's easy to say, but this has to be, uh, this has been the bottleneck in second generation uh, biofuel. That is how to effectively economically break down cellulose into glucose. It, it is still the challenge today, even for today's cellulose ethanol that uh, eventually make the cellulose as more expensive than starch. All right, go back to the general bioprocess flow sheet. I mentioned we need to use different microorganisms for the fermentation that I will talk more in the following 15 minutes. And uh, there has been a number of high tech like genetic engineering, metabolic engineering, functional genomic, system biology, synthetic biology, and omic technology used in the research. I will not talk about this. That's too technical for this talk. And the feedstock in a, a range from starch to sugar cane to biomass, like wood chip and so forth, or corn uh, stover. And in my talk, I will focus on fermentation and the engineering the microorganism to facilitate the bioconversion and briefly on separation and a uh, little bit on the integration of the process. All right. So I will focus on Clostridia for as the microorganism or the biocatalyst to convert the feedstock into the biofuel. The Clostridia is a anaerobic bacteria. They are quite robust in using various carbon sources for growth, including starch, sugar, straw, wood chip, and even industrial fuel gas containing carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and hydrogen. Or in the uh, wood chip or straw can be gasified into the sink gas. And this can be converted by uh, Clostridia to biofuel. Now, 
even though very uh, many native clostridium strain can use various carbon source, but the, the efficiency need to be improved in order to make economical production in industry. So, you know, some of the, my research have focused on engineering the clostridia for biobutane production from biomass and the carbon dioxide. We have worked on a number of different species listed here. And the reason we wanted to produce N-butanol instead of ethanol, as most people are doing now, is N-butanol is for carbon alcohol. It has a much higher energy content, 40% higher than ethanol. So when you blend butanol with gasoline, you don't lose much energy. But if you blend ethanol with gasoline, you lose 30% of the energy in your gasoline. Okay. Additional advantage include butanol is hyd hydrophobic, not uh, hygroscopic, will not absorb moisture. So it's good for your car engine. And also it's not uh, highly volatile as uh, ethanol. So it's uh, not flammable as flammable. So it's uh, safe. And it is compatible with existing uh, infrastructure, including the pipeline and the so forth. So you can blend the butanol at the uh, petroleum refinery. As opposed for ethanol, you have to ship the ethanol to the uh, final uh, blending station uh, and put into the, uh, uh, the the gas pump. Okay, so you know, uh, ethanol require different uh, infrastructure in order to use to be used as a biofuel and with lower energy. Additionally, butanol can be easily upgraded to diesel type fuel and also jet fuel. So you know, uh, can be used for car, for truck, and for airplane. So that's the advantage. So it's considered as the drop in advanced biofuel. To produce butanol, historically, uh, some Clostridia, like uh, Clostridia estopetyrican and Clostridia bejurinkii, they can easily convert glucose to acetate butyrate and uh, acetone, ethanol, and butanol. So this is a relatively complex metabolism involving two phases, acetogenesis and solventogenesis in order to produce the solvent, acetone, butanol, and ethanol. That's why it's called ABE fermentation. And our focus is to get butanol. We don't want the, to get Acid, we don't want to get acetone or ethanol because butanol is much better than ethanol. So we have been working on metabolic engineering, trying to engineer the pathway to direct the carbon glucose into the target product, butanol. However, uh, these microorganisms are difficult to engineer because so many different uh, pathway and uh, physiological shift difficult to control, okay? So we chose a different microorganism to start with. So we chose an acetogenic bacteria. Natively, they only produce acetate and butyrate, unlike the uh, solventogenic also produce ABE. They only produce this two, but uh, they are missing only one gene, ADHE2, that can convert acetyl-CoA to ethanol and the butyryl-CoA to butanol. So we were able to just clone or engineer the acetogenic bacteria with one heterologous gene to make them produce butanol as the major product. So this work was done by my poster, Dr. Yu, showing here. And similar approach can be used, you know, for other organisms, they may be able to use starch biomass hydrolysate or uh, use cellulose, or uh, use syngas, okay? So the only thing they miss is this gene to produce the alcohol. And with that engineered strain, uh, my PhD student, now a Dr. Du, he evaluated different cellulosic feedstock like cotton stock, sugar can buy gas, so we've been how cone fiber after acid pretreatment and enzyme hydrolysis, the hydrolysis sugar can be easily converted 
in the bioreactor to make N-butanol. And here is the fermentation kinetics showing different feedstock hydrolysate. Okay, they produce consistently the butanol at a relatively high titer. And the yield and productivity are also uh, much better than conventional ABE fermentation. And the process is was very stable. So this work has been published. The only problem is in the previous uh, fermentation process, we have to break down the polysaccharide cellulose, which is a challenge to do and can cause many unnecessary uh, issue. So one of the uh, approach to overcome that challenge is if we can combine the enzyme production, the cellulase production and the hydrolysis and fermentation into one step, that can much simplify the entire process because the enzyme is expensive. If you produce the cellulases and you buy from the commercial source, they're expensive. So if the organism itself can have the cellulases to break down the cellulose, then you don't need the, that additional step or cost. cost. So this is so-called consolidated bioprocessing to simplify the process and reduce the cost. So to do that, uh, we have to identify some clostridia which has the cellulases, can use cellulose director without requiring exogenic uh, added uh, cellulases. So one of the acetogen we identify is the clostridium cellulovorin and uh, similar to the previous one, okay, uh, we engineer the ADHE2 gene to convert the original uh, butyric acid and the acetic acid production into alcohol production, ethanol and butanol. And in the fermentation process, you also release carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So about one third of the carbon in the original carbohydrate is released as carbon dioxide. I will address this issue later on. If we could reuse the CO2, then we can increase the product yield by 50%, okay? So my PhD student, Dr. Yang, okay, shown in here, she was able to engineer the cellular warren to express this ADHE2 gene to produce butanol successfully, okay? And uh, then my next PhD student continue her work trying to further improve the fermentation efficiency. So we have looked at the different approach uh, this may be relatively complicated to you, but uh, anyway, we have ethanol and butanol and the, our desirable product is butanol. So we have looked at different strategies, trying to direct the carbon coming in into butanol instead of going to other byproduct. Okay, so I will just show you one story that is published uh, this year, earlier in BB biotech bioengineering. So in this study, we try to direct the glucose into the C4 butanol instead of C2 ethanol by looking at the three gene. One is the cyolase, the other is uh, HBD. They are involved in the pathway from acetyl-CoA to butyryl-CoA. So we overexpress this gene. Another gene is FNR which involve in the reducing power, the NADH regeneration, which is required for the ethanol production, uh, butanol production. Okay, so by overexpressing the combination of the three gene, we were able to greatly improve the butanol yield and the C4 to C2 ratio, as shown in the slide here, using glucose or cellulose and with additional uh, artificial electron carrier, missile biologin added in the median, we can further improve the butanol yield to close to 35% or 0.35.
that is very high. The ABE fermentation can only produce about 0.22. So it's more than 50% increase in the butanol yield from glucose or cellulose uh, with the butanol as the major uh, final product. So this is a, a pretty good uh, result. Now, going back to the question, uh, what about the carbon dioxide? I mentioned one third of the initial uh, carbon source is released as the CO2 and hydrogen. Okay, so you know we have uh, work on uh, co-culture fermentation. The carbon dioxide released from the fermentation here will be converted back to acetyl-CoA, then back to butanol using uh, acetogen, which has the wood lambda pathway to convert CO2 hydrogen into acetyl-CoA. If we were able to do this, theoretically, we can increase the butanol yield by 50% and to reach a theoretical yield of 0.6. That is very high, you know, compared to the current ethanol fermentation, the yield is about 0.4 something. So if we can get more than 0.5, that's even better than ethanol production, okay? And also by re-assimilating the carbon dioxide, we can essentially eliminate any CO2 emission. So the GHG emission can be further reduced by additional 50% compared to the current uh, bioethanol, biobutanol process. So the microorganism able to fix carbon dioxide include something listed here, okay? And uh, in general, it is known this strict anaerobic capacitotrophic acetogen, they can convert one more glucose to two more acetate without releasing any carbon dioxide. So it's 100% recovery of the carbon in the substrate. Okay, so that is uh, uh, excellent. Okay, however, they produce acetate instead of the uh, biofuel. However, there are some clostridia. They not only can produce acetate, they also can produce ethanol in the fermentation from carbon dioxide and the carbon monoxide. Okay, and some can even produce some trace amount of uh, higher alcohol or acid. So that is the, uh, our uh, uh, research trying to see if we can use this type of capacitotrophic acetogen to convert CO to hydrogen released in the fermentation to additional alcohol, ethanol and butanol. So my PhD student, uh, Dr. Chen, she worked on Clostridia capacitovorin. Uh, I show, without getting into the detail, show you that in the also expressing the ADHE2 gene or ADHE2 plus FNR gene, we were able to uh, produce large amount ethanol and uh, butanol by this organism from carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Okay, so this is an, an ongoing effort we wanted to produce more butanol, but right now uh, ethanol is the major product for this one. So to summarize all the approach I have mentioned, we use several variant engineer that, so we can use cellulose directly, and we engineer the carbostotrophic acetogen, so we can also reassimilate CO2 to hydrogen to produce additional uh, ethanol and butanol in the process. I like to mention, so far I have mentioned starting from the polysaccharide cellulose, hemicellulose, biomass containing about 45% cellulose, 30% hemicellulose, and 20% lignin. And this polysaccharide has to be somehow hydrolyzed by using the endogenous or exogenous uh, cellulases to glucose and xylose, and then fermentation to produce organic acid and the alcohol, and uh, we'll release some CO2 and hydrogen. Another approach, as I mentioned earlier, thermal K 
chemical conversion or gasification, you can convert this biomass into syngas, CO2, carbon monoxide, hydrogen, and they also can be uh, converted to organic acid and alcohol by fermentation, okay? So uh, I will not talk about the technology here. That's another uh, big area or effort. So I talk about engineering the cell as the factory to produce the biofuel. And I'd like to briefly mention in the process, we have to uh, grow the cell into high cell density, like uh, the technology we developed at Ohio State and patented uh, many years ago, that to give you high cell density as shown in the SEM picture here. And high cell density means high productivity. You can get the conversion very efficient. The power conversion in general, uh, compared to thermal chemical process is uh, the productivity of conversion rate is in general uh, lower, but by increasing the cell density by 10 or 100 fold, you can increase the productivity to economical level. Another important issue is the separation. After we get the product, okay, uh, bio conversion, usually the product is produced at a relatively low titer. So efficient recovery and concentration before purification is important. Uh, is required for economical production. So we have worked on a number of technology for in situ recovery of the product butanol, like uh, gas stripping. That can very efficiently to get the low concentration butanol at the less than 1% in the fermentation process into higher than 10% after stripping and condensation. And uh, at the greater than 10% concentration, the butanol actually uh, can be separated into two phases. And the upper phase, the organic phase, contain 65% weight percent of the butanol. So this is very high compared to ethanol fermentation. Usually you get to about 12%. So the higher concentration means lower energy for the recovery. So typically after fermentation, you need to uh, do distillation to recover butanol or ethanol. For butanol, usually you have two distillation columns uh, and a decanter to recover the butanol from the fermentation brass. And we have looking at the uh, alternative uh, technology using pervaporation as a low energy separation method to pre-concentrate the feed that can be then much easier or uh, require much less energy in the distillation for final recovery to reduce the energy input from uh, conventional process per kilo butanol require about 40 uh, meg megajoule. But the, with the hybrid process with pre-evaporation for pre-concentration, we can reduce by more than 50% of the energy input required in the recovery process. So as shown in here, okay, the conventional process require 40.2, but the, with evaporation before the distillation, we can reduce the energy by more than 50%. Some, uh, if the membrane is highly selective, can be more than 75% reduction in energy input in the final recovery. And that will make the biobutanol recovery production uh, economical attractive. So to summarize, we have looked at different process, okay, conventional process, using lignocellulosic biomass require some pretreatment, hydrolysis and fermentation separation to get the butanol and release CO2 and hydrogen. And the consolidated bioprocess combining hydrolysis fermentation, okay, you can simplify the conversion step, but still release CO2 and hydrogen. And the ultimate goal is to get the consolidated integrated process in integrating the hydrolysis fermentation and separation into one integrated process and also reincorporation the CO2 to hydrogen to make the final product. So with that, okay, we expect we will be able to produce butanol 
it uh, costs less than 2.5 gallon, uh, 2.5 dollar per gallon. Compared to the current industrial ABE fermentation from corn, it's about 4.5 dollars per gallon. And the current butanol uh, chemical market price is about 6.5 dollars. So you know, uh, the biobutanol produced using the consolidated integrated process should be uh, competitive to the petroleum derived butanol and as well as corn derived ethanol and the uh, butanol. That means if we do it right, we can make money. So that's the white biotechnology technology as the money tree to generate a huge profit. Especially when the oil price is now back to over seventy dollars, it is an attractive uh, economic uh, incentive to do this. All right. So I like to mention, you know, the first generation ethanol production from glucose, second generation from cellulose, and cellulose hydrolysis contain both glucose and the xylose. And the traditional yeast fermentation cannot use xylose. So in uh, more than 30, 40 years ago, people have been looking at the engineering the yeast so they can more efficiently use xylose to use both glucose xylose to produce ethanol. So this is uh, relatively simple by today's standard. It can be done you know, in a month or less than a few weeks. However, this took more than 10, 15 years by my former uh, supervisor at Purdue, uh, Dr. Nancy Ho. She spent her, you know, almost whole career engineered the, uh, the yeast to produce ethanol from both glucose and the xylose. And she eventually was rewarded uh, by the uh, pres Presidential uh, Technology Award from the White House uh, by uh, President Obama in 2015. Okay, so there is a big reward working in this area because biofuel is such an important uh, concern for the society and for energy security and for sustainability. But this is the past. Currently, as I mentioned, the key is how to get this monosaccharide from polysaccharide cellulose, hemicellulose. So the enzyme is the key to break down and it's the major cost. Okay, so you know, protein engineering, enzyme engineering is a very hot topic these days. How to design the enzyme to more efficiently break down the polysaccharide is uh, uh, should be a very rewarding area for research development. Okay, this is a picture I took uh, about two years ago when I attend my son's uh, PhD graduation at Caltech and her uh, his advisor, Francis Arnold was given the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for her uh, career work in protein engineering with uh, direct evolution. So this is an interesting area uh, need to be incorporated in the uh, biofuel uh, research development effort. Another uh, important area, upcoming area is ecological engineering. You know, I mentioned a number of microorganisms and the uh, uh, actually, you know, uh, in nature, you know, it's not single organism to work to produce the final uh, uh, product. Uh, an example is anaerobic digestion. All kinds of complex polymer, protein, carbohydrate, lipid can be converted to final product, methane and carbon dioxide. So people have been working on this to trying to find a good microorganism that can more easily break down the complex molecule to get the organic acid and alcohol in addition to the methane. Methane is a low value product. Okay, anyway, so actually this was my PhD research at Purdue more than 40 years ago. To summarize the advantage Bioresource engineering or bioprocessing for value added product. You know, we aim to produce higher value product from agricultural commodity and the residue. And uh, for better use, disposal of this processing waste. And uh, the product through bioconversion can be considered a nature, healthier consumer product. 
and that the process can achieve uh, zero emission or is a non-polluting process, especially if we were able to reassimilate the released carbon dioxide to become carbon neutral or negative GHG emission. So to close, I just want to say you know, uh, there are many books, including the two I added in the past, and uh, they may or may not be available at the OSU library, but uh, uh, there are many, many similar books out there related to bioprocess for biofuel chemical production, biorefinery, and so forth. And in my talk, I mentioned a number of journals uh, we publish in the related topic. So finally, I have to acknowledge you in the, the work done by my current and the past student and poster. And this is the picture taken uh, more than two years ago for a picnic group picture. You know, we all in the, uh, like to return to normal. We can go out for pic uh, picnic again. Okay, when you know, uh, now everything is open, I hope. So we can go back to have picnic. And uh, you know, I'd like to thank my wife here. And the uh, funding sources from Department of Energy, RPRE, EERE, and NSF, and the uh, Ohio Department of Development, and uh, a number of uh, company as a collaborator. And uh, my former advisor, teacher at Purdue, and last, probably not least, my collaborator, my long-term, long-time collaborator, uh, Dave Remy. He is the guy driving this old Buick, powered by 100% butane, though, more than 10, 15 years ago. That raised the attention by industry to produce butane instead of just ethanol. And uh, uh, I have. A few minutes, and uh, let me let me say one thing. Then we can I can answer question. We are using the bacteria that can eat up organic matter to produce biobutanol. Well, butanol is a four carbon. Molecule. So this is Dave Remy. Ethanol okay. is two carbon. I am uh, not so going to show the entire video. It is about three ethanol. minutes. And uh, you can view them if you have interest. But uh, 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 I like to stop here and uh, to no answer any question you may have. Thank you very much, Dr. Yang, for your awesome presentation. Uh, I mean, uh, this talk is very personal to me as I worked with one of the EFRCs at Purdue to look at the plant side for biofuels, how to increase biomass. But anyway, um, we have many questions posted in the chat and I'll read them as many as possible at, as the time allow us to. So the first question is, um, what would be the most environmentally friendly source material to use? That is, uses the least land slash water to produce the amount needed. Okay, that's a very good question. Okay, certainly, you know, if you use the waste product like agricultural residue, so you are not using additional uh, land to produce them. So, you know, that's one uh, source of the uh, biomass. Uh, second one is, you know, there are many uh, land which is not uh, suitable for growing the food crop, you know, like some land uh, is uh, dry or uh, salty, and you can grow the energy crop. So that's the second source. And third one is, of course, if you can directly using carbon dioxide, then you don't need to grow this plant. Okay, so, you know, those are the different sources and the actually depends depends on availability. 
Okay, so follow up on that, uh, the source material. Uh, uh, what is your insight, insight about, for example, not using crops, but uh, using materials that not displacing native plants, uh, also supporting local ecosystems? Yeah, and uh, like I said, okay, you know, for instance, uh, there are many fermentation process to produce various uh, product, chemical, uh, even for ethanol. And so they release large amount of carbon dioxide. So those can be used as a feedstock to uh, using the using the acetogen to convert to the uh, biofuel. Okay, uh, as a matter of fact, you know, Lanza Tech uh, has some uh, uh, plant in China using the uh, industrial fruit gas containing carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and hydrogen to produce ethanol and other chemical. So that certainly is using existing fruit gas or waste product as the feedstock without uh, growing additional crop. Cool. You know, there are challenges to, do, to use this technology, okay? Yeah, definitely. So uh, the second question is interesting. Uh, so ethanol degrades the interior of a two cycle engines. There has been little efforts by industry to create two cycle engines that are ethanol friendly. It seems like there would be a way to code or reconstitute the engine to reduce the risk of damage from degrading ethanol and the release of oxygen and moisture. Do you think this issue is being explored or might companies prefer ruined or replaced two cycle engines that at the same time, the rose public support for ethanol? Yeah, uh, you know, in Brazil, okay, they have the, you know, a hybrid car can use either 100% gasoline or 100% ethanol. They already, you know, uh, kind of uh, address the issue you mentioned for the car engine. So that can be addressed, okay. And uh, in the U.S., most of the car can only accept up to 10% or maybe 15% ethanol, not higher because the concern of the moisture, the corrosion, okay. But if we use butanol, there's no such concern. We don't need to modify your engine. You can use the straight butanol without any modification. Like uh, uh, my collaborator, David Remy, have uh, demonstrated that this is an old Buick. All right, so the next question is, uh, have biofills refineries been able to scale up to generate large amount of fills? Yes, uh, you know, ethanol has been done, okay. That's, uh, everyone has seen that. And even cellulosic ethanol, now there are several plants in operation, although, you know, they are slow and the behind original expectation, but they are coming up. And as I mentioned, the main challenge is still to reduce the cost of the enzyme to break down the cellulose, okay. And uh, for butanol, you know, the first generation butanol fuel is produced from corn ABE fermentation or in you know, a uh, uh, GIVO using engineered yeast produce isobutanol, but also from corn. Uh, nobody has really used cellulose material to produce butanol yet. Okay, but that can be done. And that's why we were doing the research with DOE and RPRE and so forth. Okay, that's cool. Uh, I think we have time for one last question. And uh, Danny posted, uh, saying, I have used this topic as a as an interdisciplinary research area in a library taught course. This research area is research in uh, many areas, but in particular, our agriculture units. Do you know how many people on campus are researching in this area? Uh, you know, engineering, I'm the only one, but in agriculture, there are quite a few. Uh, uh, someone on the Worcester campus is doing that. All right. Uh, so I think uh, with this, uh, I would like to thank you, Dr. Yang, for your awesome presentation and uh, spending time with us today. Thank you very much. You're welcome.